Section 31. The Poor Man's Bank. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Hirsch. If the love of money is the root of all evil, the want of money is the cause of an immensity of evil and trouble. The moment you begin, practically, to alleviate the miseries of the people, you discover that the eternal want of pence is one of their greatest difficulties. In my most sanguine moments I have never dreamed of smoothing this difficulty out of the lot of man, but it is surely no unattainable ideal to establish a poor man's bank, which will extend to the lower middle class and the working population the advantages of the credit system which is the very foundation of our boasted commerce. It might be better that there should be no such thing as credit, that no one should lend money, and that everyone should be compelled to rely solely upon whatever ready money he may possess from day to day. But if so, let us apply the principle all round. Do not let us glory in our worldwide commerce, and boast ourselves in our riches obtained in so many cases by the ignoring of this principle. If it is right for a great merchant to have dealings with his banker, if it is indispensable for the due carrying on of business of the rich men that they should have at their elbow a credit system, which will from time to time accommodate them with needful advances and enable them to stand up against the pressure of sudden demands which otherwise would wreck them, then surely the case is still stronger for providing a similar resource for the smaller men, the weaker men. At present, society is organized far too much on the principle of giving to him who hath, so that he shall have more abundantly and taking away from him who hath not even that which he hath. If we are to really benefit the poor, we can only do so by practical measures. We have merely to look around and see the kind of advantages which wealthy men find indispensable for the due management of their business, and ask ourselves whether poor men cannot be supplied with the same opportunities. The reason why they are not is obvious. To supply the needs of the rich is a means of making yourself rich. To supply the needs of the poor will involve you in trouble so out of proportion to the profit that the game may not be worth the candle. Men go into banking and other businesses for the sake of obtaining what the American humorist said was the chief end of man in these modern times namely, 10%. To obtain a 10%, what will not men do? They will penetrate the bowels of the earth, explore the depths of the sea, ascend the snow-capped mountain's highest peak, or navigate the air, if they can be guaranteed a 10%. I do not venture to suggest that the business of a poor man's bank would yield 10% or even five, but I think it might be made to pay its expenses, and the resulting gain to the community would be enormous. Ask any merchant in your acquaintance where his business would be if he had no banker, and then, when you have his answer, ask yourself whether it would not be an object worth taking some trouble to secure to furnish the great mass of our fellow countrymen on sound business principles, with the advantages of the credit system which is found to work so beneficially for the well-to-do few. Some day I hope the state may be sufficiently enlightened to take up this business itself. At present it is left in the hands of the pawnbroker and the loan agency, and a set of sharks who cruelly prey upon the interests of the poor. The establishment of land banks, where the poor man is almost always a peasant, has been one of the features of modern legislation in Russia, Germany, and elsewhere. 
the institution of a poor man's bank will be i hope before long one of the recognized objects of our own government pending that i venture to throw out a suggestion without in any way pledging myself to add this branch of activity to the already gigantic range of operations foreshadowed in this book would it not be possible for some philanthropists with capital to establish on a clearly defined principle a poor man's bank for the making of small loans on good security or making advances to those who are in danger of being overwhelmed by sudden financial pressure in fact for doing for the little man what all the banks do for the big man meanwhile should it enter into the heart of some benevolently disposed possessor of wealth to give the price of a racehorse or of an old master to form the nucleus of the necessary capital i will certainly experiment in this direction i can anticipate the sneer of the cynic who scoffs at what he calls my glorified pawn shop i am indifferent to his sneers a mont de piete the very name mount of piety shows that the poor man's bank is regarded as anything but an objectionable institution across the channel might be an excellent institution in england owing however to the vested interests of the existing traders it might be impossible for the state to establish it excepting at a ruinous expense there would be no difficulty however of instituting a private mont de piete which would confer an incalculable boon upon the struggling poor further i am by no means indisposed to recognize the necessity of dealing with this subject in connection with the labor bureau provided that one clearly recognized principle can be acted upon that principle is that a man shall be free to bind himself as security for the repayment of a loan that is to pledge himself to work for his rations until such time as he has repaid capital and interest an illustration or two will explain what i mean here is a carpenter who comes to our labor shed he is an honest decent man who has by sickness or some other calamity been reduced to destitution he has by degrees pawned one article after another to keep body and soul together until at last he has been compelled to pawn his tools we register him and an employer comes along who wants a carpenter whom we can recommend we at once suggest this man but then arises this difficulty he has no tools what are we to do as things are at present the man loses the job and continues on our hands obviously it is most desirable in the interest of the community that the man should get his tools out of pawn but who is to take the responsibility of advancing the money to redeem them this difficulty might be met i think by the man entering into a legal undertaking to make over his wages to us or such proportion of them as would be convenient to his circumstances we in turn undertaking to find him in food and shelter until such time as he has repaid the advance made that obligation it would be the truest kindness to enforce with Radamantine severity until the man is out of debt he is not his own master all that he can make over his actual rations and shelter money should belong to his creditor of course such an arrangement might be varied indefinitely by private agreement the repayment of installments could be spread ever a longer or shorter time but the mainstay of the whole principle would be the execution of a legal agreement by which the man makes over the whole product of his labor to the bank until he has repaid his debt take another instance 
a clerk who has been many years in the situation and has a large family which he has brought up respectably and educated he has every prospect of retiring in a few years upon a superannuating allowance but is suddenly confronted by a claim often through no fault of his own of a sum of fifty or a hundred pounds which is quite beyond his means he has been a careful saving man who has never borrowed a penny in his life and does not know where to turn in his emergency if he cannot raise this money he will be sold up his family will be scattered his situation and his prospective pension will be lost and blank ruin will stare him in the face now were he in receipt of an income of ten times the amount he would probably have a banking account and in consequence be able to secure an advance of all he needed from his banker why should he not be able to pledge his salary or a portion of it to an institution which would enable him to pay off his debt on terms that while sufficiently remunerative to the bank would not unduly embarrass him at present what does the poor wretch do he consults his friends who it is quite possible are as hard up as himself or he applies to some loan agency and as likely as not falls into the hands of sharpers who indeed let him have the money but at interest altogether out of proportion to the risk which they run and use the advantage which their position gives them to extort every penny he has a great black book written within and without in letters of lamentation mourning and woe might be written on the dealings of these usurers with their victims in every land it is of little service denouncing these extortioners they have always existed and probably always will but what we can do is to circumscribe the range of their operations and the number of their victims this can only be done by a legitimate and merciful provision for these poor creatures in their hours of desperate need so as to prevent their falling into the hands of these remorseless wretches who have wrecked the fortunes of thousands and driven many a decent man to suicide or a premature grave there are endless ramifications of this principle which do not need to be described here but before leaving the subject i may allude to an evil which is a cruel reality alas to a multitude of unfortunate men and women i refer to the working of the higher system the decent poor man or woman who is anxious to earn an honest penny by the use of it may be a mangle or a sewing machine a lathe or some other indispensable instrument and is without the few pounds necessary to buy it must take it on the higher system that is to say for the accommodation of being allowed to pay for the machine by installments he is charged in addition to the full market value of his purchase ten or twenty times the amount of what would be a fair rate of interest and more than this if he should at any time through misfortune fail in his payment the total amount already paid will be confiscated the machine seized and the money lost here again we fall back on our analogy of what goes on in a small community where neighbors know each other take for instance when a lad who is recognized as bright promising honest and industrious who wants to make a start in life which requires some little outlay his better to do neighbor will often assist him by providing the capital necessary to enable him to make a way for himself in the world the neighbor does this because he knows the lad because the family is at least related by ties of neighborhood and the honor of the lad's family is a security upon which a man may safely advance a small sum 
all this would equally apply to a destitute widow, an artisan suddenly thrown out of work, an orphan family, or the like. In the large city all this kindly helpfulness disappears, and with it go all those small acts of service which are, as it were, the buffers which save men from being crushed to death against the iron walls of circumstances. We must try to replace them in some way or other if we are to get back, not to the Garden of Eden, but to the ordinary conditions of life, as they exist in a healthy, small community. No institution, it is true, can ever replace the magic bond of personal friendship. But if we have the whole mass of society permeated in every direction by brotherly associations established for the purpose of mutual help and sympathizing counsel, it is not an impossible thing to believe that we shall be able to do something to restore the missing element in modern civilization. End of section 31. Recording by Tom Hirsch.